Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name's Joe, as part of the Friends International Guildford team here in Surrey, and I'm joined by somebody very special this evening, uh, Mark, who I'm going to hand over to straight away uh, to introduce himself to you. Mark. Thank you very much, Joe, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Stanley. I've lived locally in Guildford for just over 34 years. And I'd just like to spend the next few minutes explaining how I got interested in amateur, amateur astronomy. Um, we'll just talk a little bit about how you can find some, um, some, some of the more obvious uh, constellations in the sky, the kind of equipment that you could use if you get interested in this. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the solar system, um, some useful apps that you can download for your mobile phone, and then we'll talk a bit about um, the dark skies, where you can go and look at the night sky. So I'd just like to start with a verse from Psalm 19. Um, whenever I, I look at the, 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 the sky at night and I see the stars in the heavens, I'm, I'm reminded of this verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And this is a picture that was taken by a gentleman called Matthew Savage, um, not up in North Yorkshire, and uh, this is early evening, but in a dark sky area, and you can see the Milky Way rising up through the middle of the picture there. So my interest in astronomy started in 1969. Um, I was nine years old, and the Apollo 11 mission was just about to launch. And uh, what I'd like to do is just show you a few seconds uh, of some footage. Um, bear with me a minute. So, just to explain what you're looking at, on the right hand side you have some uh, professional still photographs. In the top left corner here you have the TV picture that we were able to see. Ours were in black and white as we didn't have a colour television at the time. And in the bottom left hand corner you have um, the conversations going on between Mission Control and Neil Armstrong at the top of the rocket. So we're going to start about 20 seconds just before launch. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. TR 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And that's on. Let's go. I'm going to pause it just there, just to let you know that um, there are something like 400,000 people across the world that enable these missions to take place. Um, and the, the other thing to say is that, that although um, space shuttle launches, satellite launches, test rockets are, are much more, more normal, um, back in this period of time, this was all very new, it was very experimental. Uh, apparently there was a 50-50 chance that this particular rocket would blow up on the launch pad. Um, thankfully it didn't. And this is a picture of Buzz Aldrin, the second uh, astronaut to land on the moon. The picture was taken by Neil Armstrong. And in the background, you've got the, the, the craft that they landed on the moon. Um, I got to see a replica of these in the, in, of this in the early 70s in a museum here in the UK. And it is terrifying about how fragile this craft was. Um, really, really flimsy materials. So these, these were really brave guys. Mark, could I just interject with it with a question, if, if, if at all possible? Um, and just to say as well to, to people watching, if you, if you do have questions, please comment um, and we'll be able to perhaps uh, consider those later on. Um, but Mark, what you just said, I think, as we spoke about before, um, we went live uh, this evening. Uh, my dad's a huge fan of this and everything. I remember watching Apollo 11 and whatnot as a young kid. But would you speak more of, if, if, if at all possible, as to the delicacy of the craft. I mean, the last picture you showed, I think I'm right in, think, in saying that parts of the craft are almost tin foil thin. That was all that was really between 
the astronauts and the outside. Is, is that right? It is. I mean, the, the actual panels of the craft were, were really, really thin strips of aluminium. Um, and then sort of keep sort of the, the, the cold elements out. This kind of gold foil that you can see it is really quite sophisticated uh, material created by a company called 3M, but it's essentially like baking foil. Um, it, so what we'd use at home? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> just that. So they had to, the objective was to keep this as light as possible um, because obviously, you know, they had, had to keep, you know, the fuel level absolutely um, to a minimum. Um, you know, liquids have their own weight in themselves. Um, and in fact, it was just a few seconds before they touched down, um, Neil realized that uh, where they were supposed to land, there were too many boulders and it was likely that it would just break the craft up. And so he had to keep, keep burning fuel uh, to find an area of land that they could safely land on. And he got a 20 second uh, warning. And if he hadn't found somewhere to land, they would have had to have aborted the mission and, re and return home. So, wow. yeah. And um, just quickly, I've had a, a comment just going to put on screen. Riz says, uh, I just wanted to say that 1969 was a great year. Uh, it was the year I was born. Shame I missed it. Great to see it again now. Thank you ever so much, Riz. Thank you for that. Uh, Mark, say, thank you. Sorry. To, to yeah. continue. Just to say, Riz, the, um, there's a website that I was using just a, a moment, moment ago, and they've got the full Apollo 11 mission from takeoff to the return to Earth. So if, uh, if you, you missed it, then you, you could watch it now. Um, this is a picture that um, the astronauts took coming out from the, the dark side of the moon um, from Apollo 11. This is very similar to um, a picture that was taken by the Apollo 8 crew. Um, the first time they flew around the dark side of the moon testing the rockets. And um, it's a very famous photograph. It's called Earthrise. And it's the first time that mankind had ever seen a photograph of the Earth from another planet or another moon. And, and you can just see it hanging there in space. And um, it's one of the most downloaded photographs in, in history. Um, and there's another verse I'd like to read from Job in the Old Testament. And uh, it says, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. And I think that verse accurately sort of sums up what you're looking at there. The earth just appears to be floating in space. Mm. I was nine years old. Um, my father was an engineer. I was already interested in cars and aircraft. And then I, and I saw that footage on television that you just saw. And uh, that, that really got me interested in, in looking at the night sky. I found out that one of my neighbors was an amateur astronomer. And she took a number of us young boys out. We were members of a local youth group. And she took us out two or three evenings and started to explain the stars and the, and the constellations that we could find in the sky. So the one, the, the photograph we're looking at here is, is called the Big Dipper or the Plough. Um, as a boy, I always thought this looked like a saucepan. We've got the handle coming down here and then the pan itself. And this is a very easy um, group of stars to find in the sky. And these are useful to enable you to find other stars that are less obvious in the sky, something we call star walking. And if you take these two stars down here and you draw a straight line out, you can do this when you're looking in the sky, and it just bends a little bit around to the right. The first bright star that you come across is Polaris. This is the North Pole star. And uh, it's a very important star. Um, so all, all of the sky revolves around that point in space. And, and this has been used by travelers, explorers, people on the seas. And once they find a pole star, they can then use this to try and work out where they are on the surface of the Earth. One of my friends at church uh, reminded me of this verse a few weeks ago. And this is from Amos in the Old Testament. And it reads, He who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns midnight into dawn and darkness day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land, the Lord is his name. And you can see at the bottom that this was written nearly 3,000 years ago, and yet we're still using names 
of, um, of, of, of constellations on, from that period in time. So this is a picture of, of Orion. Um, it's quite, quite easy to find in, in the night sky at the moment. It's, um, it'll appear later on this evening if the skies are clear in the sort of south-southwest part of the sky. And it, it's very easy to spot. You've got the, um, the two stars at the top, which form the shoulders, two stars at the bottom that form the legs. And you've got the three stars in the middle that form the belt to make Orion the hunter. And if you have binoculars or a small telescope and you look at the two stars, so that the top left one is called, um, these days it's called Betelgeuse. Um, it's, it's a giant red star. Um, it's nearly used up all of its hydrogen and, and it's absolutely massive. It, they estimate that if it replaced our sun and the solar system, it would consume all of the planets up to and including Jupiter. So it's, it's really quite a large star. Um, the one in the bottom right hand corner is a very hot, bright blue white star called Rigel. And it's the seventh brightest star in the sky. Mark, I've, I've got a quick question if we can. It's going to pop up on the screen. Um, Riz um, is asking another great question. Uh, would you see the same constellation if you were in India? Or is it only for us in the UK? So these are star constellations that you would see in the northern hemisphere. And the answer is, I think, yes. Okay. Um, Excellent. If, if you're down in Australia, you see a completely different set of, um, of star constellations. Okay. Lovely. Um, the other group of stars that was mentioned in that verse is the Pleiades. And this is a photograph of that collection of stars just there. And uh, yeah, I just thought I'd show you a photograph of that as we mentioned it. So the kind of things that you can use, I mean, the best things to start with is to find a fairly dark sky, go outside when it's clear, preferably in winter, and I'll explain why later, um, and, 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 and allow your eyes to adjust to the night sky and just use your eyes. Um, the next thing you can use would be um, a pair of binoculars and I did some research last week and you know, they've come a long way in the last 10, 15 years. And you can buy a reasonably good pair of binoculars for nighttime viewing for about 70 pounds. Mark, can I ask, um, you often see this when looking online and everything and people talk about this a lot, but if you're really wanting to get close to the stars and even to look at the moon, what level of magnification 10, 20, you see it advertised on binoculars and telescopes. What, what's kind of good to go for? So the, the, the kind of recommendations from the sort of the science reports that I was reading was, was about, you know, start with something 10 by 50. That's the, that's the kind of power that you'd be looking for. Okay. The next level up are the, the amateur telescopes. And uh, there are three main kinds. Um, the first one that we're looking at is what people most, most consider to be a typical telescope, uh, and this is called a refractor. Um, so light enters the tube at this end, um, is channeled down, strikes a, a mirror, and then is diverted out through the eyepiece. The next one is, is called a reflector, or a Newtonian reflector. It's a very large tube, and again, light enters the tube at this end, is collected and then reflected from the base and then diverted back up and then bounced out through the eyepiece here. And when I was considering buying my first telescope about 11 years ago, and I did all the research and, and for the money, I, I really thought this would be good, good value and good way to go. Um, there was a, a telescope shop in, in Dorking at the time that was highly recommended. And when I went down there and realized the size of this um, telescope and the weight of the tripod, really heavy um, and I was planning to store this in a room at the back of the house um, this was obviously a bit of a non-starter um, so did a bit more research and found that there's a third type of telescope called a compound telescope which is a mixture of lenses and mirrors and this is the actual telescope that I bought so this is about you know if this telescope was a meter and a half long um, my telescope is about 
half a metre. Um, and yet it has the same focal length end to end, if you like, as, as, as the previous telescope. But it's much smaller, much more compact. It's easy to put in a car and, and, and use uh, you know, when you sort of travel somewhere. So light enters the tube, it's then reflected back, it's then reflected back down again, and then out through the eyepiece. Um, the other good thing about this telescope is that it has motors and a computer. And so you take this out uh, early evening, you align it to two, two or three bright objects in the sky. They can be stars or planets. And then when you're ready to view, you can then find the, the object that you want to look at. And the nice thing about this is that it will actually track that object in the eyepiece for you for nearly an hour. And I was really quite surprised how, how quickly I mean, the stars in the sky are moving all the time. And it's only when you look in an eyepiece that you realize how quickly the star or the planet will move out of the field of view. So a, a telescope like this is, is very useful. Just say a little bit about the, the planets that make up our solar system. Um, you're probably aware of most of these. Um, and this gives you the relative size of the planets to each other. I think the first thing I'd like to say though is just look at the size of the sun. So we're just looking at the, the, the extreme edge of the sun. You then got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the rocky planets. The next four are the gas planets, Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And then finally, the, the ninth planet, some debate as to whether it really is a planet, it's Pluto. Um, moving on to the next diagram. This shows you the relative distances uh, between the planets. And again, you've just got a sliver of the sun on the left. Um, you've got four rocky planets all bunched together very close to it. Then you've got a patch called the asteroid belt. It's made up of chunks of rock and ice and dust. Then you have the four uh, gas planets, and then finally, right, right at the end, you've got Pluto. And because of the, the very large distances involved, um, the scientists came up with the idea of, of uh, something called the astronomical unit. And let me just check, make sure I get this right. So on average, the distance is, is at approximately 93 million miles. That's about 150 million kilometers. And uh, the only other thing to say, sorry, so that's the distance actually between the Earth and the Sun. And light from the Sun takes about eight minutes once it's left the, the Sun's surface to reach the Earth. Mark, as a, as a lover of the, of the sky yourself, which is your favorite planet when you look up out of the nine? I think the obvious one would be Saturn. Um, but I'll explain in a minute why that's, that's actually uh, shifted to Jupiter. Um, so one, one more um, picture, this was um, taken by a, a, a satellite called Voyager 1. It was launched in 1977 and it took 13 years to get to this point in space. It's 4 billion miles away from Earth and the scientists instructed the, the satellite to turn around and take this photograph. And this photograph is called the pale blue dot because that is the planet Earth from four billion miles away. Just gives you an idea of scale and how small the Earth becomes very, very quickly. The next few photographs um, I'd like to show you are of the moon and a couple of the planets. Um, and I've deliberately chosen photographs that, that are similar to the kind of images that you would see in a small telescope like the one that I use, rather than the really high quality glossy ones that we'd use for, from the, the big ground based observatories or other. So, this is a picture of our moon, and with a small telescope, you can see quite clearly not just the, the, uh, the impact craters, but the debris that's being thrown out on either side around the crater. And the moon has mountains, and the best time to see those mountains is when the moon is actually partially lit and you've got some light and some dark and, uh, and some contrast to be able to see them. This is a picture of Saturn. 
um, and the, the, there's thousands of rings of ice and dust that surround that planet. Um, so I thought that was um, that was incredible the first time I saw that through the eyepiece. But I've, I've changed my mind to Jupiter, and whilst it doesn't have the the, 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 the rings, not that you can see anyway. Um, what surprised me when I when I saw this through the eyepiece were these four points of light. I really wasn't expecting to see those. And these are four of the, the 79 largest moons that, um, that revolve around Jupiter. And what maybe you don't see it in this, in this picture, but what was obvious to me was that actually one of those moons, those points of light, was significantly bigger than the other three. And uh, it turns out that was Ganymede. And Ganymede is, in fact, bigger than our lunar moon, and it's bigger than the planet Mercury. So for me, that was, that was my sort of wow moment when I, went, when I saw that. Does that answer your question, Joe? I think it does, and I didn't realise we had the four, and one of them was, would you say, Gan Gan Ganymede? Ganymede. Yeah. So there are 49 moons that have been named. Wow. Um, but with the, the increase in power of telescopes, they've now increased that number to 79 currently. Um, but only 49 of them actually have names. So Jupiter has 79 moons? Yes, to wow. date. To date. There may be more, um, but that, that's, that's how many that they've been able, able to identify so far. Yeah. And this is a picture of the, the, the furthest. Um, it's actually a galaxy. Uh, so it's a, it's a galaxy outside of the Milky Way. It's the closest one to our galaxy, and it's called Andromeda. Um, it's also called M31. Um, you can see um, a faint ball of light um, with, your, with the naked eye if you are in a dark sky area. Um, otherwise, you, you, you probably are going to need a, um, a small telescope to be able to see this. And uh, the first time I, I saw this sort of faint bluish blur light in the eyepiece, um, to think that that light had traveled something like two and a half million light years. Um, to get to, to, to the back of my eyes is just incredible. Um, another phenomenon that you can look at um, are meteor showers. And this is the, uh, the, the Perseid meteor shower. Um, the, I've looked the dates up today. Um, it, it happens over four or five nights. Um, but the best two nights when you're more likely to see uh, a meteor burn up in the atmosphere is the 12th and the 13th of August. Um, and I've also checked the, the moon and, and what sort of phase it'll be, because if it's, if it's fully lit, you're not going to see very much at all. Um, but the good news is it's going to be a, a very small crescent moon. So as long as we have clear skies, then the 12th and 13th of August would be a good time to go outside and, and see if you can see them. And I've done this in the past. I've gone out in my back garden and lay down on the grass just after midnight and it takes about 20 to 30 minutes for your eyes to adjust and, uh, and I was able to see some, some shooting stars. And then finally, this is a picture that was taken in 1995 by the, the Hubble Space Telescope. The, the scientists decided to, to see if the telescope could see anything in a, in a portion of the night sky that just appeared to be very, very black. Um, and this was a portion of the sky near the, the, the big dip of the planet. And they pointed the telescope um, for 10 days, 10 consecutive days at this portion of the sky. And when they crunched all the data, they were, they were shocked when this image came up on the screen. And you're looking at thousands of stars in the galaxy that are so far away that it was impossible to see them until you had something like that. To try and view them. So, to Mark, just to confirm that that's ten days of of recording yes. what the telescope could what the telescope could see in yeah. one image. So yeah. it's almost like a, a collation, everything together. That's right. Wow. And you're looking at a portion of the sky. It's about the diameter of the end of a straw. So wow. that, that's just stunning. Some useful apps. So. I'm going to talk about two or three of the apps that I, I, I tend, tend to use most of the time. 
Um, these are all available to download for free on um, iPhone or Android phones. Um, and if you like in any of them and you want to access more of the features available, then you, you can pay for them. This particular piece of software is available on, on as you can see at the bottom, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, and you can actually view it using a conventional web browser as well. So this one's called Stellarium. It's a piece of what we call planetarium software. And this is the one I use most of the time uh, if I'm going to view something out of that at night. Um, it enables me to plan what I'm going to look at later on in the evening. I can type in the exact date and the time that I'll be outside, and it will show me what's up in the night sky. And I can work out you know, what I'm going to look at. And, and the reason for this is that the, the best viewing times for the night skies in winter, uh, the early hours of the morning, unfortunately, and it is quite often freezing. And so it's a good idea to work out in advance what it is that you're going to look at. So, so this app, Mark, helps you to plan what you're going to see when you, when you state the date. So you want to go next Saturday. This yeah. app will tell you what's going to be available on that evening. That's right. Brilliant. That's right. Really useful app. And, and when, you, when, when you're looking at the app, if you, you, if you, if you see something on the screen, um, you can just dab it with your finger or you're using a mouse curve to it if you're using a PC or a Mac. Click on that on that point of light and it will give, give you information about the star of the planet and the distance. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic piece of software. Um, and to start with, it's free. So uh, Another useful um, app to download on your phone is uh, Skyview Light. Um, so if you're out and you see a star or possibly a planet and you're not sure what it is, you can fire this app up, point your um, camera at that part of the sky, and the app will tr try and identify what star or planet it is that you're looking at. So that can be quite fun. And the moon phases calendar, I, I occasionally use this one. Um, again, I used it today to try and work out um, how full the moon would be for the 12th and 13th of August. So I was able to sort of scan ahead uh, to those specific dates and, and, and see how full the moon is going to be. And then finally, because of the, the, the country that we live in and uh, the wonderful variable weather that we have, it's always useful to have a, a good weather um, app. And this is the one that I use. It's called Clear Outside. And um, in addition to the, the conventional weather apps, it'll uh, give me an indication about cloud levels, um, at very high, medium, and low levels, and it'll also give me information about the humidity. And um, th that can be quite important if you're using um, a, a small telescope. Um, we, we have a problem where, you know, after 20 to 30 minutes, uh, condensation builds up on the lenses. And um, so, you know, if it's a clear night, and the humidity isn't too bad, then that's, that's a good thing. Uh, useful accessories. I've already mentioned that it, it, it can take about 20 to 30 minutes for our eyes to adjust to the dark sky, to the, sorry, to the, to, to the light outside at night. Um, there, are, there are two types of cells at the back of our eyes, uh, rods and cones. We use cones for the uh, the, Im the images that we see in the daylight in colour, and we use the rods um, on either side of the, of the, of the cones for the, the, the grayscale imaging that we use at night. And um, if you're outside, your eyes have adjusted, and you switch on a torch or you fire up your mobile phone, um, as soon as our eyes receive the white blue light, they immediately reset back to daytime viewing. Mm. And it's going to take another 20 to 30 minutes for them to, to adjust. And, and, and remember, if it's cold uh, and, and you're outside, you, you really don't want that to happen. So a red light torch or a headset, very useful. You can also download uh, an app for iPhone or Android, which will actually turn the screen a sort of reddish hue. And uh, so that can be useful as well. If you've got a, a telescope, and you're going to be traveling somewhere, then, then a few tools will be useful. Um, spirit level for the, uh, for the tripod as well. And I mentioned condensation being a, a, an issue on the lenses. So you can attach something called a dew shield, which is uh, made of cardboard or plastic, 
and you, you, you attach it to the end of your, your telescope and it can be sort of you know, five or six inches long and, and it can just extend the time that you're outside viewing before the, the condensation builds up. And then finally, if you have a, a motorized or computerized telescope, um, a small power tank uh, battery is, is very useful to have. It's, it's really quite frustrating if you've got some, some the conventional small batteries and they run out of power, um, it ruins, ruins your whole evening. And then the last thing is obviously you need to dress up more. Mark, is there anywhere you'd recommend to get such specialized equipment or is it just a case of going to Amazon or is there somewhere local that you'd recommend um, to, to go? There, there are there are a couple of um, uh, good, good telescope astronomy shops in, in Surrey. There was a really good one called Astronomia in Dorking, which is where I got a lot of my equipment to start with. But things like the, the torches, the headsets, the tools, um, the power tank, I bought all of those off Amazon. It was just okay. cheap. It's just cheaper to do it that way. It's just cheaper, absolutely. And um, Mark, I've just got a couple of quick questions if we can. Um, it's Riz again. Um, um, is there anything we should be looking out for that we might see coming up soon? I imagine Riz means in the next couple of weeks. Is there anything that you'd have your eyes on to see in the night sky? There, there probably is, and that's the one thing I, I didn't look up, but I'll try, <laughs> I'll try and find out for you, and uh, maybe uh, Joe could put something up for you. That'd be great, thank um, you. That um, Riz has then a, another question. Uh, is it easier to see more if you're high up? Uh, for example, she gives the location of the mount uh, rather than being in your back garden where you're low. Is it better to be higher up? So if we, there are two things to consider there. Um, if we exclude light pollution, the answer to that question is yes. So in my back garden, um, the, there are fences and trees um, surrounding houses and so anything that's appearing just above the horizon is obscured by those objects um, so if you if you're higher up um, and then you, then you don't have those ob objects obscuring the view um, the problem with the mount specifically is that you've just got so much light being thrown up by mm. um, and that, that you're really not going to see very much okay uh, so you mentioned um, dark skies, or that we're kind of, kind of heading that way. Um, really sorry, but there aren't any dark skies, true dark skies in Surrey. But the nearest darkish skies that I was able to identify, are the, the ones that you can see on the screen there. Um, I've actually used Ranmore Common three or four times now. Um, uh, about 10 or 11 years ago, when I went to a few newbie nights that were put on by the, the telescope shop. Um, first of all, to look at other um, amateur astronomers' telescopes to, to get a feel for what, what I might be looking for. And then once I bought my telescope, I'd love to take it back and they could show me how to set it up. And, and Randall was a, was a really good sort of darkish sky area to go to. The other place that I've been to um, as well is Newlands Corner. Um, so long as what you want to view is in the south part of the sky, because obviously you've got um, Woking, Guildford and Goldmore throwing up all, all the light behind you. Um, so the, those are the, the best darkish skies that I could, I could find in, in sorry, near, near Guildford. Um, these are some useful links. I would probably put these into a, into a PDF and then if, if possible, it would be possible for me to sort of download those. I'm not sure if that's something you could do, Joe. Yeah, no, we can, we can do that at a later date. That'd be great. Okay. And then just to end off, really, um, a couple of verses again from the Psalms in the Old Testament. Uh, it's another couple of verses that I often think about uh, when I'm looking at the stars at night. So when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. And um, when you when you do look at the night sky and you, you just consider the enormity of it, and just it makes me feel very small. And um, I, I just think this is this is an amazing couple of verses. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna end there if that's okay. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope I hope that was of interest. It really was, Mark, and I, I'm gonna just put this up on the screen. I think a lot of people will be echoing this. And Riz says again, thank you so much. It's been really interesting, uh, and I don't know near as much as I'd like to. Uh, Riz then goes on to say, maybe you could show us in person next time. Um, I'm sure the students, or international students, would love it, as would I. Uh, Riz says, thank you, Mark. I'll keep looking. Um, so I'm sure Riz is going to download a few apps and possibly even buy uh, a telescope or something. Fantastic. But, um, if, if, Mark, if that's something you want to do, <laughs> then we, we can certainly arrange something. I, th I think we would. That would be great. And, and Mark, I think from us all here, Friends International, and hopefully for the audiences watching as well, thank you ever so much for sharing that with us tonight. It, it's been brilliant. Some of those Some of those photos have just been or inspiring uh, i think i'm i'm reminded of the one when you showed it seeing that as a young boy that the earth hanging in in the black and it just being surrounded and, and again you, you said just now how small it makes us feel yeah um when you when you know there's billions billions of stars up there um but yeah thank you ever so much for joining us um, and for those those who are watching hope you enjoyed that um of course you can watch this back on our facebook uh, and youtube at a later date. Um, there will be uh, an extra PDF on our Instagram, a little cheat sheet, uh, which we've put together with um, all the apps Mark's mentioned, uh, places to visit, and a few of the constellations to look out for. So have a look at our Instagram tomorrow morning about nine o'clock, um, and you can grab yourself a little cheat sheet. Mark, uh, we say goodbye, um, and thank you ever so much again. Take care, and okay. we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.